nowadays where i see the young generation having a problem is number one having a stress for certain reasons for which earlier people would not simply care you know it it is a it is a different sort of what i would say outlook because of the kinds of upbringing that the modern generation youngsters are having in any job that you do you are forced to be disciplined and in research a natural tendency is to become indisciplined you know indisciplined i am not talking about in a uh, negative spirit because it is not well planned well organized and focused to a particular direction or mission phd research you know many people say that you know we are doing say uh, solving a great problem so it may take 10 years and so i do not think it's a good idea because phd is training for research it is not actually something that is the end of your research in life it cannot be defined like 3 years or 3 years 2 months 3 months 4 years 5 years etc but it cannot be stretched in an unlimited manner or you know with an indefinite goal the cancer cells when they migrate they will migrate through different blood vessels and the smallest ones are the micro capillaries or micro channels in the human body in many cases a normal cell of similar dimension will not be able to survive such a stressful condition and will not be able to migrate so the question is that what makes the cancer cell survive such a stressful condition when blood is flowing in in such a hello students microfluidics with blood have you ever heard this terminology well microfluidics is a multidisciplinary field that involves the manipulation of small amount of fluids typically in the microliter range within micro scale channels this technology has uh, various applications okay actually microfluidic devices are designed to handle and analyze small volume of blood samples which are often used for variety of purposes like medical diagnostics biomedical research and several other key applications are there but one of the most significant roles of microfluidics is in the area of cancer research okay you know microfluidic devices are used to analyze and study the circulating tumor cells which is also known as ctc which are basically cancer cells and it is designed to isolate and capture ctcs from blood sample as we all know that chemotherapy is a widely used cancer treatment however it has some significant side effects and on top of that the treatment is quite painful for the patient while chemotherapy effectively targets and kills the cancer cells to prevent the spread of the disease it also affects numerous healthy cells in the process yes therefore the actual challenge lies in distinguishing and studying the harmful cancer cells more specifically isn't it so what if it is conceivable to identify these cells more precisely and examining their growth statistics such as deformities and movement patterns for instance understanding how circulating tumor cells deform and move from one location to another could provide valuable insights so long story short if it is possible to gain control over their growth perhaps through more targeted interventions it could revolutionize the approach of cancer treatment isn't it so Let me give you insights of another interesting topic. We often fear injections or giving blood because that sharp needle causes pain, right? Now let us consider a remarkable technology that let us to draw blood or inject medicine without the discomfort of needle penetrations. Isn't that a miracle? Well, that's precisely the role of a micro needles. Think about when a female mosquito bites you. do you feel pain no right nobody feels pain that's essentially the action of micro needle this is what it does so are you feeling intriguing don't you think that what are the underlying functionality of micro needles and what can be the optimal ways to design such devices 
so that it can be both widespread and affordable to everyone. So why I am saying this is because this is one of our core discussion topics today among many others because we have a very special guest with us Professor Suman Chakraborty from IIT Kharagpur whose research primarily focus on these subjects. So what are you waiting for? Let's dive into the conversation. So thanks Professor for joining us today. So uh, we have a lot of discussions awaiting for us. So starting with, uh, so let's start from your undergraduation. Uh, you have completed from, I mean, your BE, Bachelor of Engineering from Jadavpur University. And then you went to pursue your higher studies, your MTech PhD from IISC. So if you could briefly share your journey from uh, JU to IISC. Yeah, I mean, it's a very memorable and uh, what I would say, at the same time, not very well planned journey. There are many things that we do in our lives, which are not always very, very stringently planned. So when I was a student of JU, I never had an idea, for example, what you know, or where I will land up with, maybe even after five years from then, forget about 15, 20 years. So sometimes, you know, people ask a question that what is your vision, long term, etc. I did not have even a short term vision, forget about long term vision. So my journey as an undergraduate student at JU, it was uh, quite stimulating because the JU atmosphere or ambience because of its uh, extreme openness, it gives a freedom of diverting yourself in a particular direction. I studied mechanical engineering and you know, all our teachers were great, but giving respect to them, maybe only 20% of the subjects were of interest to me. I think in second year, we got an outstanding professor in fluid mechanics, Professor Arun Bhattacharya. We call him Arun Babu and anybody you know, who has graduated from JU in our era, much before our era and you know, somewhat after our era, you know, they will talk about him. So in those days, uh, there was no question of you know, uh, teaching by PowerPoint and all those things. And he had that uh, you know, nice uh, colored chalks, uh, red, blue, uh, yellow, which were very you know, bright in a black background in the, in the blackboard. And you know, it was amazing how he would explain all those things. And uh, overall, it created a lot of interest and impact on the subject of fluid mechanics on which you know, I have made my further studies. Now, you know, with uh, that final year of JU when it came, I was very, very confused what I will do. That was an era when the IT jobs were booming. That means that anybody who, who was uh, doing any anything, basically any branch of engineering or science would get uh, opportunities of uh, uh, very so-called lucrative cam campus placement through IT jobs. And, uh, you know, frankly speaking, I also got in trap and got, you know, one such job. And then I realized that, well, uh, you know, maybe this is not going to be my cup of tea, not because of the salary, but actually what I wanted to do. Rather, I, I, I realized at that point of time, it's like second law of thermodynamics. I could not realize what I'm good at, but I could realize what I, where I am not so good at. And I, and I, I did not think, uh, you know, uh, that, that it was, uh, you know, it was something that really I wanted to do. So I opted for other jobs and uh, at that time also one job, uh, you know, one student, one job rule was prevailing. So with a lot of, uh, what I would say, manipulation of somehow convincing our placement officer, I managed uh, you know, to sit in other so-called core departmental jobs. Eventually I joined the development consultants private limited. It was, a, of course, a great experience in working there and as a design uh, engineer in, in a graduate trainee program. And at that point of time, once I got a flavor of uh, this core industry, you know, uh, this engineering design is a core industry. And I realized these are not according to my passion. And therefore, I made it a point that I will prepare well for the gate exam uh, in 1997. So I, you know, I was on job, but you know, this job is a kind of job where actually it requires engineering uh, sort of knowledge. 
so it helped me to also be in touch with uh, the core engineering that was something where because of my you know all india rank 1 uh, sort of it was a custom at that point of time that anybody you know in gate uh, you know such high rank will uh, land up at iisc for their master studies so i you know again like this was more of like a custom what everybody else was doing and i also joined iisc and went into my coursework in the masters and got a few excellent teachers including my mentor at that time professor pradeep datta he was a young faculty member at that point of time what i found is that you know if i want to pursue something which is of my interest and at the same time is giving academic exercise and fun this is what at least a research studentship will offer to me and that was something which you can say not in a very structured framework but in a bit of a coincidence landed me to iisc for my masters and eventually to my phd subsequently after my masters so i have just one additional question here that do you think mm. that your job experience mm. helped you mm. in doing your phd mm. you know in some case job experience helped positively and in some case job experience uh, you know made me feel that well uh, as i told that i am not uh, sort of fit into certain things so that sort of pumped me to get deep into research because that is where i found that possibly it was my last resort where i could exercise my intellectual freedom so to say but given you know the job experience i will tell what are the positive things that you know that uh, sort of in, inculcated in me in any job that you do you are forced to be disciplined and in research a natural tendency is to become indisciplined you know indisciplined i am not talking about in a a uh, negative spirit but in discipline in a way that is somewhat unstructured that means that you are doing well you are doing your work you are doing whatever your supervisor is uh, telling you to do but it is not giving a finish to the entire thing because it is not well planned well organized and focused to a particular direction or mission you know now that 50 students have graduated under me i still see this problem in many students who are very talented but they do not have the focus they do not have the drive and they do not have this mission mode activity to give it a finish and that is something how to plan your progress and take it to a finish in a structured way how to communicate professionally with various people these are some of the things you can say a mixture of soft skill and you uh, know technical skill this is what job experience gave and i had an outstanding boss in my first job he always encouraged to put into this kind of professional input but with an academic flair in the in the job which is not so easy to do because in the job you are more like working for a project so not always that academic flair you can put in but these are some of the experiences and these are very very positive experiences that i carried and i think that while in research and you know in subsequent stages as a professional doing research teaching etc these things help so i would say that having a job experience is quite good if someone wants to utilize it for for research and you uh, know it it was i think you know it worked out great at least for me so i just have one additional question with this so as you mentioned that we do not have that professional culture in academic students i mean for in job you have some time limit to finish this but this culture is not in there in academic but uh, nowadays in research have this industrial connection so uh, i mean it is coming gradually in the research so do you think that this is this type of discipline need to incorporate in academic also if you see well uh, you know any form of research it is not so easy to give a stringent timeline the reason is that research is always open ended if you know the answer to something uh, you will well appreciate that then that is not uh, what we call as research you know it it can be a training for doing research but research is normally on something whatever it may be for which answer is not known until you solve the problem 
so that will make it a bit open ended because you will not know that whether it will be smooth or so there will be invariably some challenges as as you are doing the research if if the research problem definition is impactful if it is not impactful and incremental as compared to what others have done there is not much challenge but then you know that is not considered to be a high quality research or impactful research impactful research will have innovation and impact both so innovation and impact both if it has to be there it cannot be something which others have already done and you are more or less reproducing that so in that way there will be an uncertainty so putting an industry like professional deadline to research is actually not a good idea but what is a good idea is to have a plan and a vision and if the plan is working or not working depending on that you should be ready to adapt yourself it's like you know you are driving your own car and suddenly you are finding that there is a road block so you have to have a way by which uh, you have to you, you should reach your destination or you may redefine your destination that is also you know sometimes needed so in that way idea of what you are going to do is very important and that is what i i meant by this professional plan it is not so much about how much time it will take definitely phd research you know many people say that you know we are doing say uh, solving a great problem so it may take 10 years and so i do not think it's a good idea because phd is training for research it is not actually something that is the end of your research in life so training for research is should not stretch beyond the limit and you and your supervisor together should have a clear idea that you know how you will bypass your challenges and eventually arrive at a goal in a reasonable time it cannot be defined like 3 years or 3 years 2 months 3 months 4 years 5 years etc but it cannot be stretched in an unlimited manner or you know with an indefinite goal so that kind of thing where whatever you have done for your phd research combine all those to a central goal and give it a finish in the form of a thesis which has its own you know standard achievements like publication patent depending on the nature of the work so that kind of vision is very important and this is what is actually practiced very deeply in the industry so in that way my emphasis is not to give a very hard deadline for any research but at the same time not to allow phd research in moving in such a sort of haphazard or unplanned or unsystematic way that they uh, that it never converges to anything meaningful that is what is my you know, idea okay thanks professor for having such a uh, meaningful insights so let us now discuss on your research so um, could you please talk about uh, your work in uh, computational fluid dynamics and nanoscale fluid dynamics and uh, later on i also have some additional questions with this okay so computational fluid dynamics this is something which is getting into certain directions which when we were in our early days as a research student we never imagined that it will be uh, you know getting into so many directions so computational fluid dynamics primarily the research you know uh, in the in the early days of the research where to solve certain problems where analytical solutions for the fluid flow equations will not exist because of many reasons it could be non linearity of the equation it could be because of complex geometry boundary conditions etc etc so the problems that were solved in those days in computational fluid dynamics were more or less quote unquote engineering problems say fluid flow through some channels pipes or maybe heat transfer in some engineering systems or plants these kinds of problems or maybe very important set of aerodynamics problems like fluid flow past a aerofoil wing or flow around a ship and they still remain to be very important problems because you cannot do very detailed experimentation on these problems and they are quite expensive to do and quite elaborate also to do so it is not so easy to do experiments and you know, getting a simulation to to get 
the idea of you know, how the fluid flow is taking place, how the forces or pressure they are distributed, this is important. But over the years, the most interesting part is that this so-called you know CFD has expanded in a way that we are utilizing it greatly for many other types of problems. For example, physiological fluid dynamics. That is how blood flows through arteries and veins or maybe other capillaries in, in human body. How cancer cells move from one uh, location to the other by metastasis. How the deep lung airway passage, that is alveoli and all, they function when somebody has an acute respiratory distress. And maybe how the surfactant drugs, you know, which, are, which are given to relieve the respiratory stress, how they will function. So these are, you know, some, I, I gave these examples because of you know, my familiarity, but there are many such areas where the CFD has uh, encroached. So nowadays, the CFD is not just CFD alone. It is not just fluid dynamics. We can call it overall say computational engineering or computational science where you have the CFD and its algorithm on one side. The application may have multi-scale and multi-physics. So you, you may on one side talk about molecular scale phenomenon because there are like you, you mentioned about nano channel flow, micro channel flow. So these are small devices and again these are getting more and more prominent because Number one, these can be manufactured now with uh, the advancement in fabrication technology. You know, there has been great advancement in fabrication technology so that whatever was very difficult to fabricate, micro channels, nano channels of precise dimension, they can be fabricated more conveniently. Not that they are still very easy to do, but they, you know, with certain resource, you are able to do that. And also the scientific know-how on these subjects are getting more and more advanced. So you can use this for many applications, like for example, energy harvesting, des water desalination, medical diagnostics. So these are some of the you know, areas where which are very, very important for human development. You can say sustainable development and all these things. So keeping that in view, all what you require is not just CFD as such, you know, what we used to learn in our student days, but combine it with multi-scale phenomenon. For example, you have molecular scale, the macroscopic world that we see. And in between what we call as mesoscopic scale, it is neither molecular nor the macroscopic. And uh, you know, there are various methods like the lattice Boltzmann, phase field, you know, several methods are, uh, you know, they have now more or less become very standard to be integrated with CFD. So these developments are taking place, multi-physics. So, when CFD started, it was more, more or less fluid mechanics, heat transfer and mass transfer that we called overall as CFD. But now, you know, electro, electromechanics is a separate area where you have electrostatics, electrodynamics, and you can combine fluid mechanics with that, which is known as electrohydrodynamics. Similarly, you have magnetohydrodynamics and combination is electromagnetohydrodynamics. So in that way, it is not just you know, fluid flow. Many doctors who are making a plan of say laser based surgery, they are trying to see how the heat transfer will take place or cryo surgery. So all these things in a simulated environment can be seen. You know, at present, it has given rise to again a very, very important and this is something which is the future of CFD research now. This is a physics informed neural network or you can say combined physics and data driven model. So in many of the problems like say fluid beat, fluid flow, heat transfer, mass transfer, electromechanics, whatever you call. So it is not like a materials world that you give a property and a boundary condition and, and solve and that's it. It's, it's, it's not like that. So if you have patient specific simulation. So nowadays there is a, there is a, what I would say a train of using CT scan or MRI images to construct the geometry of the flow, uh, the mesh, and then solve the fluid flow. And then on the basis of that, if you can organize a data set, then you can use that for training your neural network so that 
for different unknown cases you can come up with a predictive model not that every time you have to run a cfd high performance computing uh, you know work that you have to do but you can come up with a recommendation which has the patient data so it is patient specific personalized and also it has the physics of fluid flow so that you know combined physics and data driven paradigm it is really really blossoming so over the years cfd has uh, i mean they are they have flown in biology chemistry in all direction it has its own application yes. so it means that uh, students from different branch can pursue their research on cfd with their mm -hmm. own uh, yeah so if you see see you are you are a, you are a mathematics uh, expert you will re you know readily appreciate in cfd what we are doing we are actually numerically simulating certain differential equations of certain templates so if you have such differential equation templates solving a population balance problem or a banking finance problem with certain you know stochasticities may be included then it's it's just applied maths at then so you know if you if you make your mental framework in that way then encroachment of cfd is really unlimited so uh, i just have one additional question in this that uh, as you mentioned that um, uh, for the patient case when i mean the research is also i mean academic research is also applicable for a patients so how you are getting the data do you have collaborations with any medical institute yes yes, yes. now this is this, this is a very, this is a very important thing for any patient specific work uh, one is that you have to develop a model which is uh, realistic that means it has to be tuned according to the patient data so that tuning data which we formally call as training data in neural network uh, or you know if someone is using machine learning also very similar training data is needed so that training data one has to get by collaborating with uh, clinicians or clinical experts be a diagnostic expert or be a clinical expert interfacing with on say uh, radiology or other forms of pathology or diagnosis let us say in, in the covid era you know people many people had respiratory challenges but they did not have access to ct scan it is quite clear that you know at every place you don't have a ct scan machine but you have portable x ray so if you have x ray and uh, you have the image generated out of that uh, you know some kind of image uh, of your lung and then you also have the ct scan data of the same person and these two things together you will get only medical centers and if you if you train your algorithm in a way that whatever is your uh, you know ct scan based feature that sort of can be mimicked with an x ray uh, image by giving certain training to your algorithm so you require uh, inputs from the clinical experts and once you develop that algorithm it may have part cfd part image processing and image analysis and once you apply that to solve a problem what is the accuracy for that also you have to get back to a expert clinician and what we call in a language of the clinical uh, work is validation that you have a model the the model model may be a physical model or a simulation model whatever but it will give an output now how do you know that that output is reasonably accurate for individual patients so for that you need to subject it to a a pre preferably cluster randomized in a in a statistically randomized sense with lot of variabilities to trials uh, undertaken or supervised by some clinical experts because for every clinical case by their clinical standard clinical judgment what we call as gold standard they will have an output and what you predict by yourself maybe through your model simplified model that will have an output so there has to be a validation that how is your prediction comparing with what is being obtained by a gold standard in terms of the clinical reference and if it is reasonably accurate then your method is good but even if it is not accurate you can use that as a training sort of you know supervised training and in that way if you are using a bit of data science onto your prediction then you can actually make it better and better 
as you have more and more numbers of such training cases and validation cases so to sum up to your questions answer that yes a very smooth coordination and collaboration with the clinical experts is required for this kind of research okay thanks professor so could you please explain i mean the uh, technology the chip technology that has been developed uh, to aim at uh, stopping cancer from yes. spreading so summarily if you say that uh, the whole idea is uh, it is not uh, something which uh, which will actually sort of work as a therapy but it is something which will understand number 1 what are the important factors that control the movement of cancer cells in the human body and number 2 by understanding those factors how is it possible to somehow put up a control against that so that cancer doesn't spread that is the whole objective now inside the human body the cancer cells when they migrate they will migrate through different blood vessels and the smallest ones are the micro capillaries or micro channels in the human body so when the cancer cells see you have to imagine that the micro capillaries or micro channels they are of a few micron size and the cells are also a few micron size so the when the cells are invading through these channels and and they are invading through the blood stream if the invasion is successful they will go to a new place and set up a new cancerous colony there which is known as metastasis that happens in the advanced stages of cancer so when the cancer cell is moving through that micro channel in the human body it undergoes you know extreme shape deformation because it is it is a constricted passage and still it is successful whereas in many cases a normal cell of similar dimension will not be able to survive such a stressful condition and will not be able to migrate so the question is that what makes the cancer cell survive such a stressful condition when blood is flowing in in such a you can say human body micro capillary to get an answer to this it is not possible to do numerous experiments in the human body and see what you know how if you vary factors what will happen so the whole idea is to make device which we call as tumor on a chip then you will get an idea of the exclusivity by which the cancer cell can survive and what are the factors which help them to survive so that is what is the whole you can say tumor on a chip technology so with this i mean with the development of this chip technology is it possible to avoid chemotherapy i mean people so this is you know this this is something like you know even if you have a chemotherapy you will see that the chemotherapy in many cases it has a problem because of several factors one is the so called side effect that uh, it it disturbs the immune system in a way that when the cancer you know a few of the cancer cells if they are still there you know surviving and uh, if the disease comes back then the body's immunity is not good enough to to fight against that and this is a this is a big problem so if you can have somehow maybe it is very futuristic a dynamic therapy to the targeted to the membranes of the uh, metas metastatic cancer cells and if they are isolated and treated in that way that can be i think uh, an ultimate to very selectively identifying and destroying the cancer cells and leaving the normal human body physiology unaffected so that the immune system etc will not be compromised there is a long way to go to achieve this but what i can say is that you know every little direction that uh, you know one progresses in that way may be very very important towards that final goal so you have this micro needles which is inspired by my mosquito bites so uh, my question is is it possible so to make them painless even when uh, the doctor is taking more blood no yes uh, this uh, micro needle painless micro needle if you see 
its painlessness is based on the mechanism of the fluid suction or fluid delivery both of which is being uh, organized or orchestrated by surface tension surface tension driven flow now surface tension cannot really pump or suck a high volume of fluid but what can be done is instead of one single needle you can have a array of micro needles each needle can uh, manipulate or handle a small volume of a few micro liter of fluid but a large number of such needles in an array can actually uh, handle a significant volume of fluid be it suction be it injection and uh, that in fact uh, is is practically feasible you have this invention of the chip technology my micro needles so with this i have one interesting question that how do you get the idea of design i mean how you are going to design the devices and that also takes care of the application no no yes yes so you know if you know, these are certain you know these are certain areas where you require a design and you also require a manufacturing not just design so design will require the computational tools we have already discussed and that you know may have a high level of innovation but you have to also keep in mind that it it is a technology where you also have to do manufacturing so manufacturing is something where you will uh, you have to make your design work so manufacturing is a very very important thing because very very sophisticated manufacturing technologies are more common in research lab but if you want to scale them up for a product which is not very expensive then you have to make your design in a way that the product can be manufactured uh in a uh, with with reasonable resources and this aspect is called as design for manufacturing can be made with reasonable quality control and the product not exceeding a limit of price or cost so that you know common people can afford if you are aiming for a affordable technology okay thanks professor for such an insightful discussions for your research so could you please share about your current projects and opportunities for interns or fresh phd's in your research group okay so uh, if you see that uh, you know our group it works on primarily two types of work one is fundamental uh, which has both theory and experimental aspects and another is very very applied or translational for example making certain diagnostic devices or you know technologies for practical use so in that way there is a wide variety of requirement in general someone with a flair of learning new things and applying it to problems uh, hard working and motivated someone is like that and is looking for opportunities to do research in any of these aspects they are most welcome since all these research works are interdisciplinary we normally require research scholars from different backgrounds someone who doesn't have any experience of research but is passionate to take up research in the future such undergraduate students uh, in their senior years they are also the most welcome i have opportunities for research assistants and associates from both private uh, funded projects company funded projects and government funded projects with an opportunity for doing masters phd post doc and you know all these works in the relevant academic program to get degree and at the same time working in project and you know getting a practical flair so any one of this type they are very much free to write to me and uh, if there is a matching case that means that we require such people in our group for the next uh, maybe one or two years at least i will be very happy to you know, process the case or help the case to move forward through whatever formalities they are required so nowadays uh, stress management has become a questions in various iits so uh, 
as an experienced faculty member what advice would you give to students especially when it comes to managing stress at iit nowadays where i see the young generation having a problem is number one having a stress for certain reasons for which earlier people would not simply care you know it it is a it is a different sort of what i would say outlook because of the kinds of upbringing that the modern generation youngsters are having so when we were uh, school children the normal thing you know normal thing was every day there will be you know some uh, incidents where you will be scolded sometimes physically beaten i am not saying it is good what i am saying is that what used to happen so all people were more resilient and sometimes okay it is it is fine we used to accept it and in those days anyone who is uh, you know scolded or punished in the school will dare to make a complaint of that again to the parent because parent will say oh you have made a mistake and parent will give a double dose of the same thing if not more so that was an era where with little perturbation people would not get disturbed but now it it is to do with upbringing parenting you know we are all responsible because you know i am you know my role as a teacher is there my role as a parent is also and we are all sort of responsible for this kind of thing all the families are nuclear families so people are more or less see children are more or less knowing one or two people you know one or two you know guardian and you know senior people not like many in a joint family previous era that used to happen there would be some elderly at home grandparents they would absorb many things they would give you know many inputs which are really lessons of wisdom in life and those things are currently only ornamental you know spending time with them is an exception but the common thing is that people are confined and that confinement is more when they are engaged with their smartphones so you will find that they are with their own you know electronic world virtual world so to say mobile game whatever it is a virtual world and virtual world cannot take care of your real issues and i know in in hostels there are students who do not even know who are their next door neighbor friends or colleagues or uh, hallmates whatever name you give and uh, but they may have chatted with that person whenever needed they will send message they may send email or whatever but physically they may have not met many people when you physically meet people when you engage in many things including physical sports your lots of stresses are relieved automatically see we are bound to get stressful we are all humans so even if you are staying calm and quiet there will always be some wrong personality who will put stress on you so the question is if someone has put stress on you what would you do you may sort of relieve it you know uh, to some near and dear ones you may completely sort of get detached from that as a student you know i, I you know i knew that uh, say some day when the day has not gone well some exam i i thought that i would be doing good but i have not done good maybe i have got into the cricket field and tried to hit the ball as hard as possible knowing fully that i will never become a cricketer at the end the job you know the target was not to become a cricketer but actually to mix with people have a physical activity have a sport and relieve your stress you keep your you know sort of blood flowing in the body adrenaline moving and in that way when you come back you come back refreshed and maybe you have forgotten some of the stresses because those most of those stressful events are very temporary they are not going to impact you permanently so i would say that if one gets back to a hybrid lifestyle but part of the lifestyle is the modern engagement with smartphone and all because they are doing great things i'm not saying that you 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 need to avoid that completely or great get rid of that completely because then you cannot do your activities everything is almost you know app driven uh, in that way 
or computer driven. But what I am saying is that also try to find out some time or some scope or some opportunity where it is a sort of you can say a human engagement rather than a machine engagement. So in that way, if you have a hybrid existence of yourself, just like you know, nowadays we have hybrid mode of meeting, some physical, some online, and it has made us much more uh, professional and we can utilize the time, we can relax every time we don't have to move out from home and still do our jobs. So all these things are possible. So in that way, if youngsters remember that whatever little thing is disturbing them, that is not going to be the end of life. If they wait and watch and get into a middle age like us or maybe later age, they will realize that those are really irrelevant things for which they bothered so much. Life is a very long journey and even if you have downs, if and if you keep your moral high, you will have ups. You know, for anybody who, you know, who is knowing the, the basic maths, you know, life is like a sign curve. So you have crest and trough, you have ups and downs. If you have downs, you will have ups. If you are somehow disturbed, if you are somehow distressed, Time, your time will come. There will be a change. So always, you know, stand on your strides. Whatever at this young age you are thinking too much disturbing, be it personal, be it related to your studies, to your jobs, you will realize, you know, when you reach at some age that, you know, those were nothing. So it is really, I think that it's a shame and it, you know, somehow it should be stopped that people tend to almost finish their lives because of, you know, such such events. You know, if you are stressed, you express it to some, some people. Nowadays, there are organizations who can address. If you have a teacher, say you are there in an academic institute, maybe all teachers are not to your liking, but at least one or two teachers will be there who are behaving or who are willing to behave with you in a more personalized manner, just like your elderly ones or your parents. You talk with them and you will then realize that there's kinds of things for which young students, they are thinking that they are stressed. They are nothing as compared to the big picture of life. So if we look into this in that way and holistically engage, see as teachers, we also have a responsibility. We should not treat students as role numbers, just like doctors should not treat patients as bed numbers. We should be passionate. We should be at least giving them a hearing of, you know, what is their issue. If we can engage them in more positive things, I'm sure they will not get deep into depression or distress and have a very positive outlook towards life. Thanks, Professor, for uh, such a thorough discussions on this topic. Uh, have a nice day. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ayan.